Hello, friends. This is presentation number two of this seminar. Um, what is the cost of the majority of your problems? We are going to start with a word of prayer. We're just going to do a little bit of a review of the first one, and we're launching into the second presentation, which will last another 20 to 25 minutes. Now, let's start with prayer. I'll invite you to join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your wisdom and for your, your desire for your children, not just to be educated by your spirit, but also, Father, that they will not just stay on the theory, but they will walk the walk as, uh, as you expected us to do, to follow Christ in his footsteps. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Okay, friends, so in the first presentation, we, um, we outlined that the time traveling of the past and living in a virtual past reality is one of the major causes of your problems. Some of you might already feel identified just with that, traveling in the past. The fact that uh, I was, uh, I made decisions that I'm now regret. Now I have to do something, I have to, to say to you that though I am practicing on a daily basis the um, the solution that I will present to you on presentation number three and presentation number four, as it is found in Christ. As I as I actually practice that every every day or every week or regularly, I have to admit to you that I too fell for that trap, the trap of going to the past and creating my mind an alternative reality. My family and I, we, my three children were born in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I consider still Perth, or at least the memory that I have of it, as one of the best cities in the world. Bear in mind that I haven't been in every single city of the world, but definitely one of the best ones in Australia. For the family, uh, just the lifestyle there. And so on, so much so that there was a very famous Argentinian soccer player called um, Gabriel Batistuta, very famous one. And he was playing in Italy um, at the time where um, my wife, Veronica, and I, we were heading towards Perth. And he, he made a study. Uh, he, he paid for a study. He paid an agency for a study. He was about to retire. He had plenty of money, a lot of millions of dollars. And he paid to this agency, I want you to tell me what's the best place to be and to bring up a family. And after paying all that money, uh, Batis Tutor's um, family arrived to Perth because that was the result in the middle of the 90s or so. That was the result of the study given back to him, moved to Perth in Western Australia. So at the same time that we arrived, my wife and I arrived there, uh, obviously, we didn't have Batistuta's money. Uh, but at the same time that we arrived there, Batistuta arrived to Perth. And I will go, I'll catch the train, I'll go to work in Batistuta's, uh, and Batistuta, and I will pass through a golf co course uh, heading, to, heading to work. And from the window of the train, I could actually see Batistuta just playing golf. So obviously, maybe Perth was even better for him than it was for me. But I have to admit that to this day, I still consider Perth the best place in Australia. The climate was fantastic. It was dry. Um, it's low, low on allergens. So very little uh, allergies in Perth. Um, winter was short. There was plenty of water, nevertheless. They could actually get water from the ocean, uh, desalination plant. They had, they had a lot of aquifers. And, and the climate was fantastic. You could almost be around the, the year in your shorts and t-shirts, almost. And uh, so the alternative would be something like Queensland where yes, um, good weather from the heat point of view, but maybe too hot and too humid, you'll be sweating all the time, not in Perth. You know, it will be hot, but you're not sweating. You can enjoy time with the family and so on. Do you know how many times I regret it? live in Perth. We lived there for seven years. All my three children were born in Perth. And uh, we moved to New South Wales. And from New South Wales, we moved where we are now. Beautiful place down in Victoria, uh, where the winters last seven months. 
beautiful place here, but you know how many times I really, really the, the whole process and I thought, oh man, you know, I had a fantastic job, outdoor job. I was all the time outdoor. I could do, um, it wasn't hard on the physical, but I was just walking like 12, 15 kilometers a day. I was one of those couriers in the middle of the beautiful city of Perth with a little trolley knowing everybody in town and just delivering parcels like a postman. So I could walk every day easily my 10,000, my 20,000 and my 25,000 steps in a town where rain was not a common thing. So you will not get wet, uh, though you were working outside, get all the vitamin D. I had a decent salary. I had a very easy mortgage and it was a beautiful place to live. And I had a lot of time with my family there and so on. In my mind, many times I said to myself, was I stupid or what? Why on earth I made the decision to move from paradise? So I regretted it many times. And in fact, the story that I'm just sharing with you was one of the catalysts that made me realize that the way in which I was doing reminism of that experience in Perth and the way I was actually creating alternative realities of that past. So I would just go and imagine that by now the house will be fully paid. I could just work on a part-time basis, um, you know, and all the travels that I've got today, we wouldn't have them there kind of thing. And I started realizing that that was hurting me because it was in, it taking away from me the possibility to enjoy what I, what I had today in my reality today. And rather than treasure the, those, um, those memories, I was even, even staining the memories because I was creating alternative ones, even realities that were not in existence. So with this, I want to share with you that I, I too, was playing that game, that mind game that was hurting me. So, but that's actually creating an alternative past. But some people, together with creating an alternative past, they also create an alternative future. What do they mean by an alternative future? All springs back from the same concepts. We are discontent. We are unhappy with the situation today. We don't like where we live. We don't like well, the money that we've got in the bank. We don't like the delays that, that, uh, that, that we are given by the builder that is building our house. We don't like the situation that is currently with my, my children or my wife or my, or my husband or all this springs out with a sense of unhappiness of today in, in, and today's reality in our lives. So together with going into a virtual traveling of the past and creating a virtual uh, parallel universe and memories that are not in existence, it's just a hopeful past. Together with that is a hopeful future, an alternative future, a future that will take us out of here. The typical one, the most common one is this. And it's a sentence that uh, is a question that we use often, at least you, you used it once in your life, I'm pretty sure. If you're old enough, I'm pretty sure you've been confronted with this question, even if it was a man, a group of, group of friends. Uh, and look, th there's nothing wrong with the question that I'm, I'm about to, to bring, bring up. There's nothing wrong with the question. The problem is if we take that question and we take it to an unhealthy answer in which we dwell on a virtual future. And the question is very simple. You've been exposed to it. You heard it before. What would you do with a million dollars? Doesn't matter where the million dollars come from. Let's say, you know, you find a lottery ticket. Uh, we don't buy lottery, right? So you find a lottery ticket. Uh, or do you just happen to have a person uh, in your family that unfortunately passes away and you are, you are the beneficiary of the will and you get a million dollars. 
whatever it is, what will you do with a million dollars? You pay your taxes already. And after you pay your taxes of that million dollars, after you pay whatever it needs to be paid, whatever, you get a million dollars. What will you do? Now, as I said, there's nothing wrong with that, with that question. The question, you know, and we can just dream. Why not? Just dream about it. But at some point, we need to stop dreaming and we need to face with the reality that, uh, you know, I'm getting $25 an hour. I'm unemployed at the moment. I, uh, I've been injured and I can't go to work. Um, we got a debt from decisions that we made in the past and, um, and we are very far from having a million dollars. Whatever it is, our mortgage, um, it demands a lot from us. Whatever it is, that, that real reality, at some point, you need to stop dreaming. So one of the easiest ways to go into the future in a healthy way is, yes, let's go to talk about it. You know, what will you do with a million dollars? And I've got a few ideas. You know, everybody said, well, you know, I will make sure that I put some for the work of the Lord. And, you know, I also look after my family, you know, my extended family, my brothers or whatever. And then obviously a little bit, you know, I want to make sure that I'm stable myself. And then, you know, to to spread the word of the Lord and so on. So everybody has plans in a fictitious future event that hasn't happened. And because it hasn't happened and you have no guarantee that it will happen, it's only good for a bit of a laugh, for a little bit of a, what well, will happen. But it's unhealthy if you dwell on it. Now, that is a typical question. What would you do with a million dollars? But alternative to that, there are subcategories that in reality, they just feed the same, um, the same monster, that virtual future. You don't need a lottery ticket or you don't need a million dollars. You can just find a perfect job. So you, there you are, you are on your job, you're, you're milking cows and you are picking up with a shovel, the poo from these cows into a wheelbarrow, but you're not there. Oh, if I, if, if I could get a different job, a job that would pay better, that would be cleaner than this. Now, you're not asking for a million dollars. You're not, you're not projecting a million dollars alternative future, but you're projecting a different job, uh, virtual future. That's what you're projecting. So if you are single, oh, if I, if, I, if I only can find the right person, the right individual, why do you think there are, there are men and women in secular society and non-secular society, let me tell you, that they portray themselves or they project themselves with a famous actor or a fam famous singer. And I'm saying, and not on, um, and, non, and not only on secular society, but also on um, Christian circles. Hmm. That person at church that just preached today seems like a very spiritual person. It's a very spiritual per person. It's a very, uh, Look at that young man, he's very spiritual. And they live in an alternative future of living happy ever, ever after with that person. It's interesting because um, some of you know my, my testimony and my wife's testimony. If not, I'll recommend you to, um, it's on YouTube. Um, it's, it's on YouTube. Um, if you just put Oscar Sandy Veronica's testimony, uh, you'll you'll get it in English and in Spanish. But um, so my my wife died of cancer in September two thousand and eighteen. Some uh, friend of mine, she looks after my YouTube channel and she looks after my Facebook account. Uh, I don't I don't look after that one. She looks after that one, and she looks after the social media of um, where we upload presentations on health and presentations on practical Christianity. And uh, within two weeks, within two weeks of my wife's um, death, uh, falling asleep in Christ, 
within two weeks, she actually sent me images of Facebook posts in regards to myself where ladies, roughly my wife's age, or a little bit younger, even a little bit older, um, they were talking about me. And they were talking about me in the sense of, okay, he's a spiritual, or at least it seems a spiritual. Um, he is a professional and apparently good looking, according to that, those, okay, I wasn't the one uh, writing about myself. And he's a widow. And I'm thinking, how desperate do you need to be to look at a man that, is that just buried his wife and how bad you consider your reality, that you're already protect, projecting yourself, living together with a recently um, made, made widow, a widower, to live together. It was, it was just amazing. I, I, share, I share with a number of people, my wife and I will never wear um, rings. Uh, when we first got married, um, I purchased a couple of rings and uh, within a year, we were in the ocean and we lost the rings. But ever since my wife um, was buried, I actually purchased a $8 ring from eBay. Uh, and I put in here on purpose. And the, and the purpose of this is precisely that, uh, to remind anyone of any lady with those type of intentions that I'm still married. And I'm looking forward to see my wife again in the morning of the resurrection. And I'm still married. And you would not believe how, what a difference this makes with an $8, $8 ring, you know, to make sure that those ladies are kept away from me. Because I want to see my wife in the morning of resurrection and I'm waiting for her. I have that hope. Now, the... The living on a virtual future normally doesn't come by itself. Those people uh, that live in a virtual future, an alternative future, they also inter inter interlock it with an alternative past. So they are unhappy with their past. They are, so they create an alternative past. And they are unhappy with the current situation. So they create an alternative future. Now, in regards to the alternative future, notice also what happens in Christian circles, and this is important to note, to, to note in Christian circles, in regards to final events. Now, final events are in the future. No question about, I mean, what I mean by in the future, there's still more to come, put it that way. Okay, there's events that are happening, but there's still more to come. So, they have a reality today, but they're living in a future that's still to come. Let me illustrate because I see this, what I'm about to share with you, see this uh, quite regularly. And I think it has increased to a, to a very unhealthy way in the last 18 months with the COVID pandemic and all the, all the thing that has been created uh, around it, you know, the mindset of, of, of the people. Let me illustrate. Living in a virtual future, escaping the reality of today. This is just an example. You know, I'm not talking about you precisely. You might know somebody. But I want you to get the principle that I'm, that I'm presenting here. What I'm talking about. What is behind what I'm talking about here. The escaping of current reality for a hopeful future or a future that's still not here. So husband wakes up in the morning, turns on the mobile, but he's not going to turn on the mobile to watch Netflix, to escape his reality watching Netflix. No, no, no. He's not going to go into YouTube and to watch movies or, or, um, or, or history channel. No, 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 no. Okay, it's not it's not going to go into the internet to check porn or pornographic website. No, no, no. It's not going to go and um, into the internet just to to check on on websites that um, destroyed uh, Christianity. No, he's literally going to go 
turn on his mobile and he's going to go into any new developments of what is going to come with a new world order that is not yet here whatever aspect is not yet here but still to come so he needs to check on there then he goes to youtube channels where um somebody that is up to date with new developments will share information with with this husband you know through the through a youtube channel or through a website or whatever this is about to happen so in february this is about to happen in march this is about to happen march 19 there's a particular special conference this is about to happen now we are in january right now where is our mind taking us oh man Remember in March, what is going to happen in March? What is going to happen in March, the 19th of March? So let's say we are in 2020, so a couple of years back, and, and, and we spent, this husband spends 2020 waiting for whatever is going to happen in March, then, um, then COVID hits, and then, okay, how is this relating to the final events? So then he goes into the computer and he finds out the different theories that are here and there and there, this Congress, you know, he finds out documents from Russia. He, he finds out patterns of the COVID, uh, you know, how the COVID uh, um, retrovirus was actually patented. And he finds out the different theories, you know, how he, he leaked out of China and how was the bigger picture, was the biggest plan. And how the um, how this is out of con control? These that you know, okay. So he's studying all those things. He's studying, you know, and how is this going to lead to this? And how is this going to lead to that? And how is this going to just be united with this? And they're going to create this and so on. When is that going to happen? Well, the first step the stage will be in October, but then in Fe in February we'll have this. Now February comes then what do we need when we need something that will happen in april so then now we need to look for april then april 2021 and now in september and of course you know then you have the the environment uh conference all the way in the northern hemisphere within ireland and then so you that's where this is going to be and now we need to have something of what's going to happen in december but then after december now we are in january 2022 so we need to sort of okay what's next now, when you notice, he is living in an expectation continuously of what is going to happen tomorrow. An expectation of tomorrow continuously. And that feeds even his desire to get up in the morning because if nothing happens tomorrow, do you know what happens to, what happens to him? He needs to face today. He needs to actually face today. Now, I'm going to tell you what's happening in the home. While he is in his office, working out all the final events and how all those final events are going to be played out and so on. Do you know who is doing the vacuum in the house? The wife. She's doing the cooking. He cannot be interrupted because, because he's doing things for the Lord. He's actually working out the final events, the puzzle, all the putting all the pieces on the puzzle or, on how this is going to be signed in this particular day. And that will lead to this particular reaction socially. And this will, you know, um, create in this, this political, geopolitical shifting. And this will then lead to the congressman in the United States to do this, that, and the other. And then the United Nations will. So he's working out the world and the wife is doing the dishes. And uh, the wife is cutting the lawns around his house. And he cannot be interrupted. He cannot be socialized with people, with neighbors. He cannot help the neighbors if the neighbor needs help because he's working out the future. He's working out what is about to happen in order to do what? I'll tell you what, for him, it's easier to work in out the future than take charge of the present, alleviate the workload of his wife, tell her that he loves her that 
go and cut the loans of the neighbor. Tell the neighbor that there is a love that, that is a God that loves them. It's easier to work it out the pieces of the final future events that get up and be relevant today and, uh, and take his son for a hike and spend time with him and listen to what the son has to say. It is actually easier for him to escape the current reality and live in the future of the events. I'm just going to close with a prayer in this second presentation. And the next two, we will make an attempt to present a solution because God is not a God of theory. He's a God of theory that, that wants us to put it into practice. We'll close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing to our attention things that might be happening in our behavior, in our mind, to escape the relevance that you want us to be on today. We thank you, Father, for the time that you, you have us here together. I pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit that will give each and every single one of us the, the, the conviction in our own particular and personal situation on how these problems might be manifested in our own, in our own lives. And now, Lord, that we're heading to hear from, from your word um, solutions. Also, let our hearts be receptive to it. In Jesus' holy and precious name. <music>